Welcome to the Seed Family Podcast, where we explore natural, homeschooling, gentle parenting, simple living, and family adventure. I'm Rachel Rainbolt, the Sage Parenting Coach, coming to you from the Pacific Northwest, where I live wild and free in connection with my three wildlings and the papa bear in our fixer-upper on the beach. This is episode 64, and today I'm here with Ashley Warner talking about having a second baby. Ashley is a psychologist from Australia who works with parents around the world who are looking to heal old wounds, shift intergenerational patterns, and step onto more of a respectful parenting path. She is also a mom of two young boys who are, of course, her greatest teachers. So join us around the campfire, and let's get living the family life of our dreams. Adventure this week was a 12 mile quadricycle ride through the forest on old train tracks. It was so fun. <laughs> we cruised six miles downhill and then summited up the back half like champions. We were sweating and cheering, and my kids beamed as the rest of the group pulled in. And the guide told them that less than 20% of people complete the journey without the assistance of the motorized cart. I could see the sense of accomplishment on their faces, like visual evidence of the lesson, we can do hard things. Each quadricycle held four people, so we started with one parent in each, but halfway through we switched up and all three kids were in the lead vehicle right in front of my husband and I. We don't go out to fancy dinners together much because these kinds of moments are our dates. For an hour, we laughed and pedaled and cheered and breathed our way up the mountain together. We all loved the experience. My teen remarked how so very us the whole day was, and they, made all, they all made us vow to return again. My little obsession right now is my wardrobe refresh. The season is changing up here in the Pacific Northwest, which means we're refreshing our buckets, our home, and my minimalist wardrobe. And while I'm swapping out components, I'm taking photos so I can share them all with you in the new minimalist wardrobe course that I'm in the process of refreshing too. So stay tuned for that. If you want to see photos and videos of our rail ride or my wardrobe refresh, then head on over to sage.family on Instagram and follow along. Welcome to the show, Ashley. Will you introduce yourself and share a bit about who you are and what you're passionate about? Hi, Rachel. Thank you for having me. It's so lovely to be here. Um, So I'm from Australia and I'm a family psychologist and I work with families all around the world, um, supporting them to, I guess, dive more into a conscious parenting, respectful parenting path. So that looks different in lots of different ways, but it's really about supporting them to understand some of the stories that they've held from their childhood and work to shift those with which don't resonate with them anymore so that they can show up with it for their children to be the parents that they want to be. And so I'm sure people can tell from that little intro that there's loads of alignment between your work (laughs) and mine. I think you like connected with my podcast and work a while ago, and then I found you on Instagram somehow. And then we've been like, I came in and talked to your membership community and we were Mm -hmm. actually like DMing and emailing for a million years, trying to nail down a topic because (laughs) There's just so much stuff that we are in alignment on. So I love it. I'm so glad to have you here. Thank you for coming. That's perfect. It was, it was, there were lots of ideas thrown, but I'm glad we've got this one. I think it's going to be great. 
<laughs> Me too. Okay. So today we are talking about having that second baby. And I want us to start with grief because it's normal for us to feel some grief, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's normal. It's such a big change and it's huge for everybody involved. But I think often what happens is um, people can focus on, you know, the toddler or the older sibling, but it's so important for us to recognize our own grief and our own shift with that our eldest child and that relationship and what that was like. And it doesn't mean we're not excited for the new baby. It doesn't mean we don't adore and love them, but change, change does come with grief. And so it's really important for us to acknowledge that and acknowledge some of those more challenging feelings that might be arising for us. Yeah. Yeah. I think sometimes that grief can be followed quickly by like guilt or Mm -hmm. shame, you know, especially for moms who are just society kind of doesn't allow any, like if you're pregnant, you're not allowed to feel anything but Mm. radiant joy and gratitude. (laughs) So hopefully we can like push back against that a little bit and create, create more space for a more authentic emotional experience. And when we are bringing a second baby into the family, it's totally normal for you to feel some grief. It is. I absolutely felt lots of grief with my second pregnancy. And I remember towards the end of my pregnancy, sitting down and having lunch with my toddler and just crying and thinking, (laughs) it's never going to be like this again. It's never going to be, we would sit down, we would listen to audio books and we would chat and we would have our lunch. And it was such a special time in our lives. It was just the two of us to spend our days in whatever way we wanted to. And I could see in that moment that that was a really special thing. And I was grieving losing that. I really was it didn't matter that I was, I was also excited about the pregnancy and I was really excited about welcoming a second baby into our home, but there was also a huge grief about how this was going to change my days with my toddler. And so it's really important for us to feel that and acknowledge that because if we don't feel our own grief and we don't work through that, then we don't have enough spaciousness in our own body to hold for the grief that will likely be coming up for our toddler as well. Yes. So let's talk about that. It's because it's also normal for our firstborns to have some big feelings. Can Mm -hmm. you speak to the feelings that might come up for an older child? Well, it's huge. They're, you know, the most important need for a child is attachment. You and I absolutely agree on that. (laughs) And so a second baby, it really represents separation. It changes the amount of capacity that we have for our oldest child and it changes the dynamic and it changes the way we're going to show up and it changes lots of different things. So for a toddler that can feel like separation from their attachment caregiver, and it doesn't matter how brilliantly we do it, that's just naturally how they're going to feel. And so there's going to be some challenging emotions that come up with that and sometimes that's going to feel like sadness sometimes that's going to feel like absolute rage and sometimes that's going to feel like jealousy towards the other sibling it's going to be you know the whole range of human emotions is going to be felt by little toddlers when they welcome a second sibling and it's understandable Yeah. And kids at any age, really, when they're welcoming a new sibling, it's normal for them to express some negative feelings. So just like what I mentioned with the grief for us, like so many of us were kind of programmed through our own upbringing to to where we felt like we weren't allowed to have negative feelings. Mm. And so Mm. that like sometimes that that guilt and that shame can follow up with something can follow right after something like grief. And sometimes parents can pass that along to their children by, by kind of imposing the same reaction on their kids. So Mm. if they say like, Mm. I hate this baby, I don't want a sibling. You say, no, you don't, you don't mean that Mm. at all. You love this baby. Like you're really Mm -hmm. not holding the space for those negative feelings to be there Mm. because they are there. So even if the literal words they're saying, you know, they might not be true in the sense that, you know, sometimes they can say some pretty extreme things (laughs) that you're confident they're not like, they're not, if they say they're going to never talk to you again, you know, Mm. (laughs) I'm sure they will, (laughs) Yes, (laughs) but but you just want to keep reflecting and validating Mm. the, the emotion that's at the heart of where, whatever they're communicating. Like, I hate this baby. I don't want to have a baby. Like, you know, you can say, Oh, you're, you're probably, I'm, I imagine you must be feeling so scared about all the changes that are going to happen. You know, we're, we're just trying to like reflect and validate, try and throw out a feeling. It doesn't even have to be perfectly right. 
and they can totally correct you. But even mm. in just throwing it out there, it helps them to get in touch with the feeling that's underlying their words and their behaviors. Like, oh, scared. Like, is that what I'm feeling? Like, mm. yeah, that could be scared. Even if they're not saying that out loud, that's still happening when you're helping to kind of coach them through that emotional intelligence building. Absolutely. And it just, it, making space for all of the feelings just allows them to be able to process those and allows them to be able to move through that difficult energy, which is obviously a huge life lesson that we want all of our children to be able to understand. But often those those feelings will be reflected in challenging behavior as well. So when we start to sit with the emotions and we start to help them feel that and acknowledge that, like you said, and validate it, then that can, and it's not going to take all of the challenging behaviors away, but it can help with those their expressions through the challenging behavior as well. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's talk about attachment before we really dive into challenging behavior, because I feel like we need this foundation first. So yes. talk to us about some of the attachment shifting and work that happens in this transition. Mm, so one of the things that I think often isn't talked about or understood is this idea of defensive attachment, which can come up. So and this is not, this is kind of a state that children move in and out of. It's not saying that ch your child doesn't have a secure attachment or anything like that. But when a child feels too vulnerable or there's too much separation for them to bear, then what can happen is that they can feel, that instead of their instincts moving them towards seeking proximity with their caregiver, they can kind of pull them away. And so what I often see in my work and what I definitely saw with my own toddler as well is this sense of, um, moving away from mum because there was this real shift that they weren't really coping with. And well, I should say not coping with, but this was one of the ways that they were trying to cope with that real, really big shift. And often that can be misunderstood as, oh, he just doesn't need me anymore. Oh, he's grown up overnight. Oh, you know, he just loves dad. Oh, that's really great. And all of those things are true, but it can also be true that these are instincts that we're seeing based on feelings of a big separation from the caregiver. And so what we want to do then is not just think that they are have grown, grown up overnight, but we want to fill them with as much connection and as much invitation for dependence as we possibly can, because that's what will get that uh, attachment back in line where we want it to be. Yes, yes. And it's funny because this actually happens like all through the lifespan, we do this. Like yes. when, once yes. you're kind of aware of it, you can start to see it all. <laughs> or like, like after I lost my mother, like I, there was definitely some, like I, I was aware of a really strong drive within me to like create distance between like emotional mm -hmm. distance between mm -hmm. me and my husband. Like I could not survive losing Yes. like my other like main person, you know, and of course yes. I didn't act on those, but just being aware of like, oh, and I can totally see how that makes sense for kids too. You know, when yes. there's, when there's a threat, it feels like a threat to them of, of a big change that's going to create some distance between you and this person you're so attached to that to try to protect yourself, mm, there's sort of exactly. this instinct to look elsewhere or to mm. push away a little bit. And I'm glad you normalized it with your husband because I notice it too. And, you know, it doesn't, we can study all of this stuff for our whole life. It doesn't make it any, <laughs> doesn't make those instincts go away. So yeah. my husband and I were just talking about this the other day, actually, how if we've been away for a couple of days and one person comes in and the other person isn't offering as much love and connection as they'd hoped, then there can be this this kind of instinct to pull away. And that's exactly what defensive attachment is. It's like, okay, yeah. I want... I want you to be opening your arms and to be offering me more connection. And if that's kind of a little bit off, even though my logical adult brain understands why, because you're at work or because of this, <laughs> there, there still can be that resistance. And so even as adults, we absolutely do this. And obviously we can be aware of it and not um, follow through on those instincts but they can still feel really strong. So it's really important to understand in our children. And this happens, you know, for example, if a child's dropped off at school or kindergarten or something and that separation is a bit too long for them to bear, then that you'll often see that it's hard to collect them again. It's hard to re-engage yeah. that connection. So they're not making eye contact or they're saying they don't want to go or, and that's that same kind of thing. So children move in and out of it all the time, but I really want it to be clear for parents to understand that it's really common for 
toddlers when a, or, or preschoolers, whatever age it is, when a new sibling comes along and to make sure that we're really offering more connection and we're inviting more dependence rather than just assuming they've grown up overnight. Yeah, absolutely. I found the key when we added another member to the family to really be shifting some of their attachment from me to the new baby. And I know mm. we're going to talk about inclusion next, but like that was really like the how for me, but that's how I, I, I observed it um, in my children each time we added another one that like if they, like the baby was the, the original baby or the, you know, the previous baby Thank was you. sort of solely focused on the attachment with me. And then it would, I, I would through kind of including them in everything that attachment would get spread over a larger number of people, if that mm. makes any sense. So I could see like, if they had like 10 units of, of necessary attachment, if 10 of them were coming from me before, maybe like nine from me and one from, you know, a husband or one from an older sibling or whatever, you know, like when a new person came in, like that would just get further spread around the people who are their people, you know, the, their primary, their additional primary attachment figures. Yes, absolutely. And we did the same with specifically with my husband. So when yeah. I was pregnant, my husband started to do all of the nighttime responsive parenting because nighttime parenting can have such a big impact on building attachments. So yes. he did, he actually started sleeping with my son and doing all of those um, gentle, emotional, responsive wakings. And that really bonded them. And that really buffered the shift when our second baby came along. Yeah. Okay. The last thing I want to say about this attachment piece is age spacing. Um, this was really, I was super intent, like all three of my pregnancies were planned and I was super intentional about the age spacing. And I know that not everybody has the opportunity to do that. Mm. And a lot of people who are listening are probably already pregnant, but I feel like that's something nobody talks about. And mm -hmm. so I just want to introduce that into the conversation that if you can factor in the development and the needs of your child at different ages and stages, and just sort of just kind of factor that into your decision of when to have another child, I think that can be hugely beneficial. All of my kids are about three years apart, which like based on my nerdy, geeky, like <laughs> research minded <laughs> study, <laughs> see that the conclusion I drew that that was that that was like the perfect age facing. <laughs> uh, but it's not that that specific number is the only right number. And, you know, like that's, that's the perfect magical number and any other number is wrong. It's just that that was definitely the right number for me and for our family. And that worked out really well. But uh, just being intentional with that age spacing, knowing mm. your kid, knowing where their developmental levels are, I think can be a real asset to this transition. Mm, absolutely. And we did similar. So we did two and kind of three quarter years. And that was because yes. I wanted to be able to breastfeed on demand up until two. And I wasn't hundred percent confident that I could be pregnant and breastfeed. So <laughs> that was kind of my decision. <laughs> yes. about it. Um, I and love I, it. And, and it seemed to have worked out really well, but I'm interested to know what, because your kids are older and a lot yeah. of the people that, you know, especially in, in Australia, what the big driving force of having babies close together is, is that they want them to be able to play when they're older. They want them to be able to be friendly with each other when they're older. So yeah. is my that, how's like that worked out with friends. your kids? No, yeah. my, my kids are yeah. totally best friends. Um, it's worked out amazingly three years for me. Well, and they're not exactly three years because I didn't want them to have the exact same birthday. No, so it's like, <laughs> a lot of like, thought that goes into this. <laughs> right? I wanted them each to have their own birthday season. Like I'm telling yeah. you, I'm a planner. So it, it is, it's like two and three quarter years then a little a little over three years or whatever. They're, they're all about three years apart. Um, but mm. for me, that felt like the perfect amount of space where they wouldn't be competing for the same mm. needs at the same mm -hmm. time. And yet they're still close enough that they would be playing together all the time and, and have be able to connect and have shared friends and all that kind of stuff. And it really has played out and worked out really, really, really well. So I'm, I'm super happy with the age spacing. And I love the logic that went behind yours about breastfeeding. And I just want to like invite everyone to be intentional, intentional about yes. it because the age spacing 
most the sort of the the moral of the stories that I typically hear that that's beyond your control. And certainly mm. it's not an exact, like you can't be a hundred percent exact with it. And depending on your situation, you know, you may not have much control over it at all, but mm. just, just mm. giving it some thought, setting some intentions, um, thinking about factors like attachment and developmental mm. ages and stages and, and different needs. Absolutely. Yes. Okay, so let's talk about that inclusion piece that I mentioned earlier. I am a big advocate of including your firstborn in everything from prenatal care to nesting to the birth to breastfeeding to co-sleeping, all that good stuff. So involvement creates investment. <laughs> That's like, I hope everyone hears that involvement creates mm -hmm. investment. It felt essential for me to communicate that mothering the new baby doesn't mean abandoning you and that this is mm -hmm. our baby. So yeah. how have you included your oldest? Well, very similar to you, we have a very strong belief in including him in everything. So that meant, uh, birth really, that's where, well, it started before birth, but I'll, yeah. I'll start there. I have, it's seems really important to me to bring into the conversation the possibility that children can be at birth. I think in our culture, yes. we view birth as scary and concerning mm -hmm. and dangerous and a medical, you know, emergency often. And often that means that our children don't get to be a part of something so big. And, you know, often I hear parents say, oh, but is my child too young? And I think, well, if your child's not too young to have a sibling come into the home, then they're <laughs> not too young to be part of the birth process. Like they're going to be part of this in whether they like it or not. And so I really, where possible, and I don't think it is possible given everyone's circumstances, I absolutely would say, you know, where you birth and where you choose to birth has to be woman-centered and it has mm -hmm. to be with your goals and your values aligned and making sure that you're in your power wherever you are that you're birthing and only then would I consider bringing in a, a toddler or a preschooler or a child in, at any age um but having them come in and be part of that process I think is hugely important and I can't imagine what it's like for children where the parent goes away for you know and I've heard terrible stories now especially with COVID where sometimes the mother has to go away for five days and there's no visiting rights and then all of a sudden mum comes back with a new baby yes. and I just think that the way that we're doing this in our culture is really misaligned and we need to be including our children in our birth space and understanding that this baby came from us that they literally because it's a very foreign concept I think some of us can even even understand being pregnant we're like we know we've got a baby inside of us and we know what's happening but it can still feel really strange and unbelievable so imagine what that's like for a toddler they know that there's a baby in there but what does that really mean whereas when they actually see that baby come from us I think that that really helps with the attachment well biologically it definitely helps with the attachment for them to yeah. be there and get all those oxytocin and those hormones but also just to be able to understand oh this baby really did come from us this isn't a baby that mum just picked up from the hospital and brought home this baby is our family and I think that that's huge for toddlers to understand so my first point of inclusion is absolutely prenatal care and and birth where possible yes it's kind of like food like right when we talk about like if you want to help your kid to have a healthy, positive relationship with food, like bring them out to the garden beds, mm, you know, plant mm, the seeds together, mm. like chop the vegetables together. Like you need to include them so that they're invested in it and they're connected. There's some connection yes. and attachment to the preparation of this food, the growing of this food, like the people who are involved in bringing this food to your plate, you know, all, all of that is so important. And we, can understand it in things like food <laughs> and it's the same <laughs> with humans <laughs> yes. so, like if your kid like you said if, if they just sort of observe your belly growing and you decorate a room then you leave for a week and you come back with another human like of course they're not going to feel an attachment mm -hmm. to that stranger who was just dropped into their house yes. you know between them and their primary attachment figure um whereas like my kids came with me to my prenatal appointments so they're mm -hmm. having the conversations with the doctor how have i been feeling you know and i'll mm -hmm. and i might look at my kid and be like how how do you think mommy's been feeling you know i'm like you 
you've been tired <laughs> like, or whatever it is. Like, mommy's so hungry, you know, like just involved. It's like, yeah, my body's working so hard, you know, seeing scans or listening to the heartbeat, like mm. all of that stuff, measuring the belly. I mean, when they're involved in all of that, they're invested. And the same is true for the birth. So my firstborn was present for the birth of my second. And I mean, he was they were sitting like right on the hospital bed beside me mm. as I'm like mm. pushing. And, and, mm. and then my older two were both present for the birth of my third. And they still talk about it today. Like, it's not yes. like they necessarily have tangible memories, you know, from start to finish of the experience, but that like, we brought you into this world, mm. you know, there's like a shared sense of ownership for that journey. And for, for, for bringing them into the world, into our family, they, they still talk about it. They'll still pull up the pictures. Oh, look, I was, you know, this is the first time I held you. And it was right after you were born. I have this great picture of my oldest, like holding my hand, like squeezing really hard while the doctor was like stitching me up. And this other great picture of my other kid, like checking out the placenta and like his eyes were like just vibrant and glowing was asking all these questions like so all of my kids were fully a part of it we talked about all the noises and sounds and smells and you know all of that that's like a normal part of birth we watched their birth video to help prepare them for it um but i think i see a really strong parallel particularly after giving birth and then after helping my mother in her final transition, there's such a really strong parallel where we, we kind of like block those off yes. those experiences, like the starting and the ending of life. And we say they're like taboo and should be done in private mm -hmm. and there's shame associated with them. And they are certainly not for children. Mm -hmm. like that's the message that we all get. And I just want to blow all of that up and <laughs> encourage everybody <laughs> Include children in these like most important, I mean, the starting and the ending of life, these are like the most important parts, right? Of like being a human mm. and being alive. Um, they're so significant. And so I just, I want to invite everybody to include your kids and all of that stuff. And then of course, like, you know, more everyday things like breastfeeding, like there's always a spot for you, you know, like I would like yes. things like that, where I wouldn't, I wouldn't nurse in like a a wooden rocking chair that only had room for me and a baby. Mm. Like I, mm. there was always space for the other kid. I baby wore everywhere so that we could still participate in lots of things that felt joyful to us. And I had my hands free and, and things like that, just sort of like physically thinking about um, how to be inclusive with your, with your firstborn. I think a little bit of creative effort goes a long way. Yes, the breastfeeding one I think is really important because uh, what I often hear suggested, even among respectful parenting spaces, is to get a special thing of toys and put it in the cupboard and then when you're breastfeeding is to bring it out and distract your toddler. Mm -hmm. And I think that just goes against everything. We're like the problem mm -hmm. is feeling disconnected. So distracting is not the answer. The answer yeah, is always yeah. going to be connection. And yeah. so obviously there are times when, you know, if you've got breastfeeding challenges and you're trying to work through, then maybe that's your priority and that's okay. But if you don't, then absolutely inclusion in that time, because at the start, it can take a really long time. It can take up for an hour to do a feed. And that's a huge yeah. time for a child. So being able to bring them in, we actually um, got a box of books. And every time I fed the baby, we'd bring the box of books and we would just read book after book after book. And my son <laughs> loved it. And so as soon as he'd see me getting ready to feed the baby, he would go and get the books and set himself up on the couch. So it didn't become a point of resistance or resentment towards the baby. It mm -hmm. became this beautiful time where we could just connect and reading was something that I could do while also nursing quite easily. Yes. Oh, what a beautiful picture and a beautiful idea of the books. With my younger two, I tandem nursed. But e even in that, there was this beautiful collaboration where like we explained to my second born before the birth or while I was present, we talked to pregnant, we talked about how after giving birth, like the first week or so, um, my milk will turn into colostrum, which is like super baby vitamins. Like, you know, it'll have a different texture and a different color and different taste and all that. Cause it's all this super healthy stuff that the baby needs. And so for the first like couple of weeks after the baby was born, my second, um, like didn't really nurse like would cuddle like while I was nursing or whatnot. And then one day he just looked up at me and he was like, are the vitamins all done now? I wanted them, oh. all the vitamins. 
like, oh my God, that's so sweet. (laughs) Yes, yes. My milk is back in. Like, yes. So just like, again, like little moments of that, like where he pulled back a little bit on breastfeeding Mm. himself, but his his under A was like, it was his choice and B his understanding of like, because I wanted to help like feed, get, get the baby, all of this really super mm-hmm. important milk, like just, Oh, that oh makes my heart how beautiful shape. is that? Oh. <laughs> okay. Now, and while he, we're he... all feeling good and our ovaries are, you know, all <laughs> squeezing up, let's we're talk all about wanting all the babies. Yes. Yeah. Let's talk about challenging behavior. <laughs> yeah, it's not all not all peace and rainbows, is yes. it? So what challenging behaviors have come up in your family and how have you nav- navigated them? Well, I guess probably the most common thing. So I have a toddler who al- was almost three when our baby was born. And the most common way of expressing frustration in toddlerhood is well, I shouldn't say the most common, but a common way is through physical aggression. And so while we've had a lot of those beautiful moments, like you've just described with your children, we've had a lot of those beautiful moments where we've seen such deep connection between our two kids. There also have been a lot of impulsive hitting and a lot of impulsive pushing. And Jude, I remember when Jude was starting to crawl, he was, um, lifting himself up and Iluka just went past and just pushed him down and I thought "Mm, that's (laughs) I can see what's going on here that is that you know okay you were just a little baby before and that was okay and now all of a sudden you're becoming a bit more like me I think I need to step in here and, and put you back in your place and what's really important here is that we respond to these and it's not easy it really is not easy to see an older child hurt a younger child. It can bring up so much stuff for us, but it is really important that we understand and respond to this with compassion. We understand brain development. We understand that they're doing the best that they can. It doesn't mean that they don't like the baby. They're just having a really hard time. And so making sure that we respond as with so much connection and not any separation kind of discipline tactic tactics so nothing like sending the child away or which I'm sure anyone listening to this podcast tries not to do anyway (laughs) but I but I just need to highlight that that idea of separation or just becoming really angry or shaming that just creates more separation between the toddler or the older child and the parent and that's only going Mm. to exacerbate the emotions in the body and therefore exacerbate the amount of challenging behaviors that we see on the surface because the challenging behaviors are just the symptom right it's the emotions underneath that are the cause so squashing down the symptom by you know with some kind of form of separation is only going to make the whole problem more challenging yeah so how did you respond when Luca pushed Jude down So it's always with the boundaries so making sure that I'm physically present and making Mm -hmm. sure that if I need to holding him or holding his arms or pulling him onto my knee and saying something like, I can't let you hurt him. And just making sure that I'm physically there and where possible preempting the hit. So you can often see it with your children. You can often see the look in their eyes or you can see, or you just start to know that uh, in this scenario is normally when an impulsive hit comes out. And so you get quite good with your reflexes of being able to catch that hit or um, put your arm in between and and blocking the hit because that's obviously the ideal. We don't Mm -hmm. want to ever let our children hit other children. So blocking the hit would be the first thing. And then if not, you know, ideally then pulling them onto your knee perhaps and saying, I can't let you do that. I'm just going to help you. And then working on the cause, not the symptoms. So focusing on maybe he's feeling a little bit out of balance and he needs some support emotionally regulating. Maybe he's feeling a little bit jealous and he needs a little bit more connection. And just trying to work on what the bigger picture is, but making sure that we always respond in the moment and making sure that you're there and you're present and you're not allowing any of that physical aggression to occur where possible. Because of course, that's going to make a challenging relationship between the siblings and that's going to make the older child feel worse about themselves. So yeah. I'm never advocating for allowing for aggression. Yes, I agree with all of that. I prevention is essentially yes. my answer. Like prevention, prevention, just like being proactive with all of this, with the meeting of the needs, being close enough to hold those boundaries where they need to be held. I get asked the question in in various forms, a lot of what do I do? The older sibling is always hitting the baby. 
to which the answer is very inconvenient, but mm -hmm. they can't be left alone without together yes. without you there. Yes. Like yes. they can't like, so if your older child is showing you, I am not able to um, safely be in physical, in shared physical space mm -hmm. with this baby without your help, then you have to listen to that and you have to adjust accordingly. Um, so for example, um, like bringing your baby, wearing your baby while you're cooking or setting mm. up your older kid at the table with an activity when you have, you know, we need to do dishes or whatever it is, or, um, I'll, sometimes, like you said, it's even like kind of proactively meeting a need. So if I know one kid really needs to get like have this really full cup of connection and physical exertion. And if they have that, then they're okay. Like being with the little one and there there's, there are no physical aggression problems, then great. When we're after like post experiences like that, then I know, okay, I can leave them alone on this floor and I don't mm. have to be within arm's reach. Um, but I really want people to think of that, like as an investment for the long term. Mm. all of this gentle parenting, peaceful parenting stuff, it always requires more energy up front, <laughs> but then way less energy on the back end. Mm. If you are chasing around after someone, no, 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 no chasing after unmet needs, right? It, it requires so much more time and energy. So yes. I know some people might feel some resistance when we say things like that. Like you have to be within arm's reach if they're both on the floor and you see that that happens. Um, you know, it's not forever. <laughs> it, and, and, and the more you do it, the more you will be able to fine tune that proactive meeting of the needs and even things like setting up of the environment. Sometimes it just takes a really small change. Like, oh, it's because both of these activities were on the same shelf. Like in my kid, mm. every time the baby started crawling that way, would feel panic that their mm. activity was going to get tossed on the floor or whatever. Like sometimes it just takes these really small shifts, but you won't even be able to get to that creative problem solving if you're not fully present and in it with them. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's exactly it. These quick fixes, because I get the same question all the time. Well, how do I stop yeah. the toddler hitting the baby? Well, you be there. And you're yeah. being physically present. And I know nobody wants that answer. Everybody's like, no, I want to be able to say the perfect sentence that yeah. is going to get through to my toddler and yeah. it's going to just magically make him stop. Well, that's not going to happen. And unless you use alarm and fear, then you aren't going to be able to stop it in that moment. The only way to stop it is to be physically present. And using fear and alarm is only going to cause, like you said, more challenges and more work for you later on. So yes, it is an investment and yes, it is challenging, but being there is protecting your relationship with your child and your child's relationship with their sibling. Yes. People are often really wanting like a punishment or a consequence to turn mm. out to prevent it happening next time when really what you have to do is learn the very subtle cues and intervene yes. before the hit happens, like right before. Because yes. if you intervene right before and then you can help walk them through a better way to get their need met, like a more efficient way of getting their need met, and you do that like a hundred times, 500 times, <laughs> then they are able to do that on their own. And then that's yes. how they solve their problems and get yes. their needs met. Then for the next, you know, 17 years that they're with you or like whatever it is, my kids still are utilizing the same processes that I taught them when they were two by walking them through these now, even as teenagers, like they can, they can identify their feeling, they can communicate in need, they can hold boundaries for themselves. All of that happens like now, like in this season when they're really little, because I stayed within arm's reach when I needed to. <laughs> So I know it's a lot of work. I know it's a lot of time, but guys, I promise it is worth it. Mm. And we're so often conditioned, aren't we, to think that because we're responding with gentleness and compassion, it means that we're not when we're condoning the behavior mm. and we're not condoning the behavior. Like I am physically present and I'm physically holding arms and I am not allowing my child to ever be aggressive, yeah. but it doesn't mean I need to shame him or yell at him or get angry at him either. And I think sometimes that 
that's the inner work that we need to do as parents is where are the stories coming up and where's the imprinting in our nervous system that says this behavior requires yeah. some form of anger otherwise I'm condoning it yeah because and if that's the belief then we really need to work to shift that because that's only going to make things more challenging and it, it's actually not true Yes. And this is really where that family culture is established. Like it's so Mm. much easier to do the work at the beginning to establish like a sibling culture or a stiff, like a a style of connection or a tone of connection, Mm. like to establish them from the beginning. Like that's, oh my gosh, it's so much easier than having kids who have been hitting each other and screaming Mm. at each other for five, 10 years. I mean, it's never too late to change but it is so much easier to do this now yes. where you establish from the very beginning. Oh, I can't let you hit him. Like I can't let, you know, just, a, just that, that sentence, like, well, I can't let you hit him, but I am here to help you. How can I help? Mm. Like something like that. I mean, it seems so simple and it takes just seconds to say, and even, even seconds sometimes just to do, but it, yes. it, it establishes the framework for what healthy attachment is and for how I can be like an ally when their needs sort of are bigger than what their <laughs> prefrontal cortex or what their brain can development manage, yes. can navigate. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I love how you said that about being an ally because that's sometimes that is it's about coming alongside your child and saying, okay, here's the problem, which is hitting, but I'm here and I'm, I'm with you. So sometimes I'll even say to my, my son, oh, those hands, look, they've got so much energy in them. Quick, let's tell them stop. Or I'll, I'll yeah. kind of come in with him. So it's me and him. And then the hands or the hitting is the problem, but I'm not... I'm not on the opposite side to him. I'm there and I'm helping and I'm stopping the behavior, but it's not necessarily that it doesn't have to be done with an angry tone. It can be done within connection. Yeah. And I love your example there because it even, it, it, it touches on that piece of understanding the need that's underlying the behavior. Mm. So like if it's a, if it's a discharge of excited energy, then I would suggest, like, I would step in and say, Ooh, give mommy that big high five. You know, it's that same sort of discharge of energy. Yes. Or if yes. the issue is like an environment issue, like a, uh, an ownership over a material kind of issue, like then that's a whole different solution, right? If I jump in, in front of him and offer him a fi- high five, when he's really concerned about his block tower, like it's not going to be helpful <laughs> and it's not going to work. So just kind of understanding and getting exactly. curious and very non-judgmental about, what the need is for him, the very real, very valid need, um, what that need is, and sort of just kind of crawling inside that reality, accepting Mm. whatever the need is. And from that place, you can be an ally and you can come up with really creative solutions, particularly in collaboration with the kids, which gives them this amazing skill set and toolbox that they can use for the rest of their lives. Yes, absolutely. And and I think also understanding that sometimes when we're full of feelings, we don't act in the way that we would always want to either. <laughs> so ha- like, let's, let's just be a little bit compassionate towards our children too. Sometimes we're yeah. expecting our toddlers to handle this massive transition in a way that we don't necessarily do. Like we get frustrated and we act outside of our values. So it's also yeah. about not necessarily labeling, labeling our children and not necessarily giving too much energy to this. This is a phase that will pass through. We need to just hold boundaries while it's there. We don't need to, you know, put a label on our children as the hitter or the aggressive one or anything like that, because then they're only going to just play up to that story. Yes. I love that you brought that narrative piece in because I talk about that in so many episodes of this (laughs) podcast. And that is so true. This is one of those very risky times Mm. where labels can Mm. really take root and do a lot of lasting damage because suddenly there's another person for which against which you can compare your child where there wasn't before. So with the firstborn, it's a little bit lower risk and the labels Mm -hmm. tend to be pretty exclusively positive. When the second kid comes along, suddenly there's an, you know, another object with which to compare and that can lead to a lot of characterizing and so assigning like intrinsic 
characteristic kind of value to something that's actually, we can just like externalize as like a behavior or a really logical attempt at getting a need met based on mm -hmm. the skills that you have, mm -hmm. this person has today. Um, you know, th so just to be really intentional with what you interpret the behavior to mean, because that's often happening on the subconscious level. Our child does something like hits a baby and our brains do this work very quickly mm. and very quietly of what does this mean about who my kid is? Mm. What does this mean about what kind of mother I am? What does this mm. mean about like, we're writing the stories like real quick, yes. like <laughs> writing those stories. So just to be very conscious of that story writing that's happening. So you can just like we were saying, like, stop with the, with the hitting, you can sort of have whatever kind of mantra it is that resonates with you that gives you that pause. And then you intentionally like restate the meaning of the behavior. Yes, it's so important because they will just play out the story that we unconsciously think about them. Mm -hmm. And if we, if that is that they're aggressive or that they, you know, they're going to be a child, I, I hear a lot of these concerns that what if they're the bully or what if they're the child that hurts other people and, you know, they're just two or three and they're dealing with <laughs> their new sibling and, and we, we put this adult meaning onto it. And so we really need to unpack that and make that our inner work to do outside of the moment and not put that stuff onto them. Absolutely. Okay, let's talk about regression, which is one of the most common questions about having another sibling, um, particularly in sort of the mainstream camp. Mainstream camp is the question I see come up all the time. Most people know that it is normal for an older sibling to have regressions, though I absolutely hate that word, um, when a new baby comes into the family. When this happens, I want you to lean in and drown them in the style of connection that they are showing you they need. Mm -hmm. If you withhold or lean back, mm -hmm. they feel more insecure in their connection with you and deepen into their regression, trying to pull you closer. So it might feel counterintuitive, but I want you to go all in. For example, if my three-year-old said he couldn't walk and he needed to be and he needed to be wrapped in a blanket too, I would swaddle him in a big blanket yes. and scoop him into my arms and carry him like laying on his back like a baby in a very like playful kind of exaggerated way. And he would love it like for 30 mm. seconds, you know, he'd be like, mommy, you're carrying me. I'm like, oh, shh, shh, babies can't talk, you know, like just, <laughs> just like being really playful and, and exaggerating it. And he would, he would love it for like 30 seconds and then he would get his spill and then he would insist that he could walk again and he was ready to get, you know, let me down, let me down. My legs are working now. Like, you yes. know, I'd be like, no, no, you're my baby. Are you sure? Like, I'm ready. I'm ready. Okay. So like just That's being kind of, kind of playfully like drowning them in whatever the need is that they're having is how you help them move through that. I love that example. And we have that exact same scenario playing out at our house. And my son often wants to be in the wrap. So he knows that, you know, and so we do, we have our three and a half year old in the wrap on our back or on our front, whatever it is while we're cooking dinner. And often it's five or 10 minutes and he says, okay, I'm done now. But it's just that we're, we're inviting more dependence than they, than they want. And that's yes. what actually creates the independence. Exactly. So when they can feel so safe in our, in our, offering of that connection and that dependence that's when they can just go up and be like actually I want to be my own person yeah <laughs> yes and it yes. does like you say it feels counterintuitive yeah because there's that like pursuer distance or dynamic where if someone yes. leans forward kind of in our face we we instinctively lean back but yes. when it comes to attachment we have, we have actually have to do the opposite <laughs> Because if we want them if we want more space we have to lean so far lean forward in. that they're the yes. ones that lean back Exactly. Like that, exactly. that is how that works. So like my ultimate question here is how do you recommend parents respond if their children infantilize themselves in some way to share in the tender, loving care that the baby is getting? Well, I think you just answered that perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> with absolutely more connection and absolutely with, yeah. by leaning in and by offering that in a playful way or thinking about the other times throughout the day when you can offer more of that. So I often think that, um, you know, I noticed a couple of weeks ago, I was changing our baby's nappy before we left for the morning. And I was, you know, going and garring and changing his nappy and spending a couple of minutes. And then all of a sudden I, I could, I went to say, 
to Iluka, oh, could you put your gum boots on, please? And then I thought, hmm, there's such a difference there. He needs to go and get mm. himself ready for the day. And I've just spent this beautiful five minutes connecting with our baby. And so instead I just said, would you like to get your gum boots on yourself or would you like me to help you? And he said, I want you to help me. And it takes 10 seconds. Yes. And so I help him and I rub his legs and I, you know, do everything I was doing with the baby to get his gum boots on. And then we go out as a family all feeling connected and with our needs met. So I think... It's also about finding those little moments throughout the day that are maybe not when they're asking for it, where you can offer it. That's really important. Yes. And that goes back to that, like being proactive and meeting their needs mm. thing. Like, cause if you hadn't done that and Aluka witnessed that interaction and then may have been feeling kind of disconnected and, mm -hmm. and, you know, like his cup was, was not full, then perhaps throughout that whole afternoon on your adventure, he could have been whining or crying exactly. or falling down a lot or you know like doing yes. a lot of things that would in a very like hammer kind of way try and elicit more hands-on interaction with you exactly yes yeah all right let's move into our q a so i asked the sage family community what questions they had about bringing a second baby home and elmian asks how do you explain to a toddler that mommy had a miscarriage and that she will not get a little sister anymore especially if the miscarriage occurred very late in the pregnancy and when a lot of the preparations for the new baby's arrival have already been done hmm. This is so hard. I'm so yeah. sorry to this family. This is awful to hear. Um, I guess just like anything we would do, it would be about being really honest and explaining it in as simple terms as possible without too much information, but without lying. So making sure that you explain that, you know, the baby stopped growing. And so the, that means that the baby's died. And that means that the baby's not going to come home. Um, but I would also, you know, add in what kind of ritual or what kind of thing can you do to mark this as significant? Because often, like we talked about at the start with we ignore birth and we ignore death in our culture, yep. we are really not great at, at honouring miscarriages and honouring the grief that that family have experienced. And so is there something that you could do as a family and maybe it's planting a tree or maybe it's going to put some flowers in the ocean or what kind of little ritual that your toddler may not necessarily understand, but they'll remember and that they'll see you processing that grief and they'll see you moving through that. And that will give them permission to do that within themselves. Yes. Oh, such great advice. Like first, I'm so sorry. I know the pain of pregnancy loss. And while I know mm -hmm. there is nothing that I can say to ease that pain, just know that you're not alone in it. That was helpful for me. Like when I had my miscarriage, just reaching out to and having other women reach out to me who I wasn't even, who I were people I wasn't even necessarily close to saying, oh, like me too. And then having somebody to different people to kind of ask questions so that I can get answers to things that people don't talk about. Um, mm. I found that really helpful. So I'm going to link to my pregnancy loss article that I kind of poured my heart and my process into when I was navigating that experience, which I did with three kids um, under wing mm. while I did it. And a big part of how I included the children in that journey was through ritual. So I, I love that you brought it up. Like we took a trip where we could sort of grieve together in nature. And we, I mean, mm. all of these rituals that we kind of moved through while we were there and it was really healing and helpful. And my, again, just like we talked about earlier and like you mentioned again, like including kids in the hard parts of life too, yes. <laughs> like being, yes. letting them have a front row seat to that it's kind of like how in a lot of like breastfeeding advocacy circles, we talk about like, how are women supposed to know how to breastfeed when we never see it, right? Like it's <laughs> normalized. You have no idea how to, it's like, go ride a bike when you've never seen anyone ride a bike mm. before in your whole life. It's the first time you're looking at a bike. You have no idea how it works. It's the same thing with big life yes. things and transitions and emotions. They, it is a huge value add to them to have the experience of being included um, in moving through these really big, really hard things, particularly if you have a really strong um, connection and a really healthy 
family dynamic in which like your children feel safe, you know, cause if there's too much stress, then they're not learning from it. Like we know that mm -hmm. they're being traumatized from it. So what's the difference? The difference is that we're not asking them to carry anything alone. We're not putting anything on them. That's not developmentally appropriate, but we're just leaving the door open and then they get to kind of come in and I, I would say they could choose not to come in, but I, quite frankly, I've, I've never seen a kid not choose to come in like in, mm -hmm. in a, in a hard moment, they may come in and out. Like that's totally normal. Like when I was grieving my kids, we started watching doctor who, like we'd never seen it before. And when I was like in bed for days, um, you know, my body preparing to like, let go of this baby we started watching Dr. Who. And so like every day at these certain times, like they would, we just like binge like the whole thing, you know, they would come in and be like, it's Dr. Who time. We'll sit with you and watch it. So I'm like, you know, kind of like quietly crying, but they're cuddled on me and watching Dr. Who and like aware of the sadness and, and being very empathetic, but also kind of titrating that attention on it, if that makes mm -hmm. sense, you know, then they would run outside and play for a couple of hours and then come back in. So just having that door open so that they know that this is our family's journey and they are a part of this experience too. Um, I found really valuable both in birth, in death. And when I lost my mom, I mean, all across the board, I found that that approach to work really well. Yes. And I love that you say that you left the door open because that's, you know, I had an experience as a child watching my family grieve and the door was absolutely shut. Mm. And as a child, you don't know what that means. You don't know whether everybody's okay. You don't yeah. know, like your meaning making brain is trying to make yes. a story around that. And so when the door is open, whether that's a literal, you're in bed and the door's open or it's figurative, mm -hmm. then it gives children the opportunity to understand and to see what's happening. And then that means they have that body memory of how grief can work yes. and that it can be this intense, challenging experience, but we will move through it like anything yes. it will rise and it will be really uncomfortable but then it will pass whereas when it's all closed off and it's not talked about and then that's when it becomes really overwhelming and children can then you know we know they're in that egocentric developmental phase that then they can start thinking there must be something wrong with me or I've done something wrong yes. so absolutely having that open for them to be a part of and join I love your story just because they literally came in and then went out yes. came in yes. and went out at their own choice with their own so that is just a beautiful example of exactly what we hope that we can move towards more in our culture which is an open door approach to grieving in front of children yes oh thank you so much for taking this conversation in places you probably didn't imagine it would be going with me <laughs> yeah. I love that about your podcasts Rachel they're always like that aren't they <laughs> They're my favorite when that happens. <laughs> Let's move into our deep dive. So the show notes can be found at sagefamily.com slash podcast 64, where you can also subscribe and get future show notes sent right to your inbox. So what are your favorite resources, Ashley, for people to dive deeper into this topic? Hmm. Well, can I say your podcast? <laughs> Not necessarily <laughs> specifically this sure. one, but I, I've shared this with you before. I loved being watching your podcast when I had a little baby. And so I would absolutely say listening to the connection pieces within that spread throughout all of the episodes in your podcast around just making connection the, the foundation for what you're doing making sure that that is so so i think if i had to say something that would be my <laughs> that would be my um recommendation thank you i'm so honored and now everybody <laughs> out there needs to go follow ashley in all the places and grab hold of all of her things so her website is holisticfamilypsychologist.com her Instagram is at Raising Humans Kind. She has a fantastic Raising Humans Collective, which is like her conscious parenting membership. And that's where I came in and we had a super fun conversation all about like how minimalism plays into gentle parenting. Um, so she is one of the few people, very few people who I can honestly say I've literally not ever heard or seen anything that you've said that I was like, hmm, I would do it differently. Like all the things I've been like, yeah, I support that. <laughs> so 
for what it's worth, her work has wow, enough. Rachel, Thanks that's of so approval. Th- thank you. <laughs> that is huge. And do you know what? That is uh, so funny you said that because I think about six months ago I was thinking about something and I was like, I don't think I've ever read a book that I've completely agreed with. I don't think I've ever read a book that I've gone, you know. And then I thought, actually, when I read stuff from Rachel, I always agree with what she says. <laughs> so it's so funny that you said that. Oh, I love it. <laughs> I wish we like were closer so we could hang out in real life. I know. Then... <laughs> well, I'll just have to move up to the Pacific Northwest and the mountains. It's definitely on our list of things yes. to do. <laughs> and are you in Australia right now? Yes, yes. So down in the south okay. coast of Victoria. So, so yeah. someday if we make it to the, did you say Victoria? Victoria, yes. Someday if we make it to Victoria, Australia. Australia is one of the places that one of my kids wants to visit. I will ah, definitely show amazing. up at the door of your beautiful <laughs> custom round home. And you'll have to have me in for some tea and our children can play and it will be lovely. Oh, sounds delightful. <laughs>